it's loading. And I believe we are live on Facebook. This is so exciting. <laughs> Um, good morning, Ask a Bookkeeper. Uh, I'm Vanessa, if you don't already know me, and I'm here with the fabulous Lauren Fogelman, who is a business coach, an author, a speaker. Her resume is like pages long. <laughs> and we're really excited this morning to be talking a bit about fear and mindset and how we can get out of our own ways in our business. Is there anything I missed there, Lauren? No, Vanessa, I, I think just you and I chatting and just digging right in will be the best way for people to get a sense of what we do and how we can actually help to get over, get over some of these things that stop us. Excellent. And I know that we also want to touch on some of the other questions we've been getting. We're really trying on Ask a Bookkeeper to target these First Friday Facebook Lives into the questions that people are asking in the group because we exist to help small business owners succeed. So um, I know that some of the questions we've been getting in the group have a lot to do with fear. Um, one of the great ones I think came in this week was um, how do I gain confidence I need to believe in myself and my abilities to handle more questions or how to dump a few of my existing clients who are driving me bonkers. And, I know this is a really common struggle for a lot of small business owners, not just in the accounting industry. So do you have any advice for this group member? Sure. I, I think the first thing is um, maybe I need to qualify why I'm able to talk with you on it. That would be a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> so, so we're going to backpedal just a little bit here. Uh, and, and basically, um, a therapist turned business coach, uh, what, what I've seen is as a therapist, there is so much that gets in the way from really achieving our full potential. And I didn't want to be stuck in helping people with the problem part of it. I wanted to help people focus on their potential and what they're capable of doing and really achieving those things. And uh, back in about 2009, I made the switch from therapy into business coaching because I figured if I can help business coaches, uh, business owners be able to get out of their own way and achieve what they want, they're going to help so many more people as well. And it's really with the intention of being able to help business owners step up and be able to deeply serve their clients and also have a business that's profitable and supports their lifestyle as opposed to one that sucks the life out of you. So when I work with my uh, clients, it's really about being able to find ways to double your income working half the time, um, which includes the mindset as well as the strategies and the tactical steps. Um, so with that being said, can you repeat the question again? Vanessa? <laughs> of course, of course. Um, so the question was, um, how do I gain confidence I need to believe in myself and my abilities to handle more quest clients? Or how do I dump a few of my existing clients who are currently driving me bonkers? Uh, okay, Th those are actually a little bit uh, two different questions. I'm yes. going to start with the dumping clients because... I think one of the things that I see with entrepreneurs is most of us are service oriented. We're doing something that we really deeply care about. We want to make a difference for our clients. And we tend to hold on to people for too long that aren't a good fit for us, whether it's employees or clients. I, I will say one of the hardest things is letting someone go, whether it's an employee or a client, because you don't want to get pushed back. You don't want someone challenging you. Uh, you don't want to disappoint people. And what I would say first is you have to know who your ideal client is. Who is it that you really work well with? And become aware of what that ideal client looks like. As you're looking at your current caseload, uh, actually, I just recently did this with an accounting professional that I'm working closely with, is we had to look at all of her file files that she uh, has with different clients, and I had her grade them, A, B, C, D, F. The A's are like the sweet spot. The B's are almost a sweet spot, but she really enjoys working with them. And then the C, D's, and F's, and we started talking about letting go of the F's first, and then the D's, mm -hmm. and later on the C's so that it's a gradual thing as an overnight thing because you don't want to uh, affect your income as you're making a change in your business also. 
the best thing you can do is recognize that sometimes when you let a non-ideal client go, you're doing them a favor as well. Right. Because it might not be a good fit on both sides, but they don't know how to end the relationship either. Yeah. One of the things that's been really helpful for me in our business is we'll tell people, we want you to have the best fit for your needs, even if it's not us. And that takes the blame out of the situation. It's not that they're a bad business owner. It's not that we're bad bad bookkeepers. It's that it wasn't a fit. And and, and Vanessa, I think that that's really an important uh, key to this whole thing is that you want it to be phrased in a way where it's coming of service for them and you're really doing what's in their best interest as opposed to making someone right or wrong, which is, I think, why we hold back from doing that to begin with. So if you want to do that, what I would say is really come from a place of service. You're doing what's in the best interest of the client. You don't have to give a long, drawn-out explanation about why you're doing that. The best explanation you can possibly give is, I'm moving my uh, business in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. that's basically what you want to say. And then let them know what the time frame is for when you're going to complete your work with them. It could be a week. It could be 30 days. However, give them some time frame to let them know that they need to get things moving forward. And you can give two recommendations also or three recommendations about who else they might want to move on to. But you don't have to do that either. Yeah. Uh, that would be up to do for you. Is that what you found also as you've been making some of these changes? Um, yeah, that's definitely what we've found. Uh, and it's always nice to make a recommendation because people feel a little lost, you know, mm -hmm. if you're just cutting them off. And it's challenging to find a good business to work with. It really is. And so having a few people in your back pocket that you can be like, look, these people are awesome. They would love to work with you. And really making it, I don't want to say impersonal because business is personal, but making it not about, like I said, not about blame, making it about mm -hmm. you would really enjoy working with this person. I think you guys would hit it off. Do you want me to make an introduction? Right. Uh, and, and, and with that being said, the other part, point that you're making is that someone who's a non-ideal client for you might be an ideal client for somebody else's business. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, like we don't, we can't, we don't like working with inventory. Right. And there are people who love inventory, mm -hmm. that it's, it's what they love to play with. And sure. so somebody with a really complex inventory shouldn't want to work with us. Right. Well, the other part is they might reach out to you and want to work with you, but then you have a responsibility not to take them on. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. so there was another part to the question also. Yes. Uh, um, how to gain confidence in the ability to handle more clients. Mm -hmm. I would say that there's many reasons why you might not have confidence. And, and that's the first thing to look at. A lot of times there's reasons of um, you feeling that you can't handle the work or that you can't handle the capacity. And it's looking at underlying what is holding you back from doing it and getting out there when someone doesn't have confidence issues. The uh, thing that I would look at is it might be that you're saying yes to everybody as mm -hmm. opposed to being selective. And, and I would look at that first is, are you afraid you're going to take someone on and then it's going to be more work than you anticipated, which is something that you and I were just talking about, Vanessa. <laughs> Uh, or is it going to be that maybe they're going to ask you to do things that are beyond what your particular skill set is? And then what you want to do is come up with really good questions during the consultation to be able to discern whether they are good fit for where your expertise is or not. If they're not, then be able to just bless them uh, and maybe give them a recommendation. But that they ought to move forward. And if they're really great for your skill set, then I would say absolutely go for it. Uh, you probably have more capacity than what you think you have. And also that if it's a matter of you don't want to have to work so hard because it's going to affect other areas of your life, you would have to give up things. That, that's a different thing that has to do with time management and really looking at having boundaries. 
So, so there's many reasons not to have the confidence, um, but I would say start to ask good questions during consultations. That way you're only bringing in people who are really a great fit for you and uh, bring out the best as far as what your skills are. Yeah. And another thing that was going through my head as you were talking is a lot of professionals I've seen have this expectation that they need to know everything about everything. And that if they say, I don't know to a client, they've failed. Mm -hmm. And one of the most powerful things that my business partner Ingrid helped me with in the beginning is it's okay to say to a client, I don't know, but I know who to ask mm -hmm. and I'll get back to you. Sure. Because that makes you a trusted advisor. Right. Uh uh, however, as, as you're talking about, that's the other thing that comes up, <laughs> which I think that we rarely ever talk about, is people are so afraid of being called out as a fake or, yes. or an imposter or a fraud or something like that. And that's going on in the back of so many entrepreneurs' minds is someone's going to eventually give them pushback and really challenge them on why do you think you're qualified to be doing that? Right. And, and that could be the root of also why someone's lacking confidence. Um, as you and Ingrid know, I have an acronym for people who feel like a fake in their business, and I'll do the clean version. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you ever feel like a fake, a fake the um, acronym is friggin' awesome kick butt entrepreneur. <laughs> and so, you can extrapolate from there. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's something that I see all the time going through the questions that come into the Ask a Bookkeeper group and in meetings with clients. clients. New clients are so embarrassed for me to see their books because mm -hmm. obviously they're a failure as an entrepreneur because they don't understand bookkeeping. A absolutely. Uh, and I will let you know with uh, my business coaching clients that I work with, one of the first things I tell them to do is to actually pass forward the bookkeeping is someone else who plays at numbers when you struggle at them. Yeah. Because thinking that you ought to do it yourself is actually an illusion. That's not going to be the best way to grow your business. Right. And, and one of my first hires was a bookkeeper as well, because I believe it's important to know your numbers. However, I don't want to be the one that's actually doing the data entry because that's not where my skill set is. Yeah. And now there are apps to handle most of the data entry and you just get mm -hmm. into playing with the reconciliations and doing a bit of financial advising because we don't know what we don't know. And most people start their business not because they want to do bookkeeping, but because they want to make clothes or they want to run tours or they want to do mm -hmm. business coaching. And they don't, they suddenly realize that they are head of HR and head of accounting and <laughs> janitor and <laughs> the whole nine yards. And so figuring out where you can, make the space for the what you love what why you started your business um so i i'm checking back to my notes because i think yeah. we've beaten that question to death um there have been a handful of questions from aspiring business owners who have yet to start their business um who are looking for tips on how to not let fear and other impediments get in their way, how to get over that and be able to start their business with confidence and start their business, make that first step. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that a lot of times we believe that we ought to have confidence and that's actually not true. You're mm -hmm. looking at doing something that you've never done yet. And of course you're not going to have confidence around it. I believe it's actually more important to have courage. Oh. And the confidence comes later as you start doing it more and more and more. Uh, and an example is when I first shifted away from the therapy into the business coaching, I had a fear of public speaking. Uh, and I knew that I had to be able to work through it because being able to get out there, educate people, talk to people was going to be a way that I was going to connect and be able to have actually clients. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went ahead and joined Toastmasters for about three or four months to be able to work through what some of those fears were regarding public speaking. Yeah. And, and now speaking is actually one of the main ways that I am able to connect with people, whether it's virtually like what we're doing now or in person, because I love to be able to educate 
and give really deep learning to people so that either they can do it themselves or they can find that there's something that is a resource for them and maybe come back and have a further conversation with me. Therefore, don't worry about the confidence. You're not going to have confidence with something you've never done yet. And that it's really about courage. And the courage comes from really knowing deeply why you want to do this. If you're building a business that's based on something that you feel very strongly about, you have passion about, you have a very strong why about, then you're going to move forward despite the fear. Right. Uh, it, it's true for me also. And one of the things that I learned uh, when I started also doing this was that if it's uncomfortable, then I ought to be doing it. <laughs> That's wonderful. If it's uncomfortable, then you ought to be doing. Yeah, it's not a lot of fun all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am aware. Uh, I, I share the fear of public speaking, and here I am running a in uh, casual, but still running a webinar. Absolutely, Vanessa. I, I, I fully agree with you and applaud you for that, because what, what I've learned is that we would much rather stay in our comfort zone and do the things that we know that are predictable, that we've done over and over and over again. However, the growth happens when you stretch beyond that comfort zone. And yeah. as you're stretching yourself beyond your comfort zone, you start to get skills that you didn't have before. And it actually makes you a better resource for your clients. You grow as a business. Uh, I fully believe that success happens from the inside out which is why we're talking about the mindset. You have so, to be willing to grow as an individual in order to reach that next level of success for your business and deeply serve your clients. Yeah, absolutely. I know when we checked in in advance of this call, there was a great conversation that we got into that is something I really strongly identify with is a lot of people have a tendency to hide in the work and say, oh, I'm so busy, I couldn't possibly get out there and network because I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And they hide in their comfort zone and they hide behind the computer and, and aren't stretching themselves and aren't getting out of the comfort zone. And I know that I, like I said, I've been guilty of that mm -hmm. and it's challenging to overcome. But once you realize you're doing it and you have the awareness, you're like, okay, that thing, I need to work on that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's also the difference between barely surviving as a business owner and really thriving. Yeah. Uh, when, you are doing some that's a stretch beyond your comfort zone. You are in a different mindset. You're very highly engaged. You're really focused. You put in a lot of energy and effort into that activity as opposed to things that you can do all day, every day, which go on automatic, and then you're not as present and focused. So stretching beyond your comfort zone actually makes you feel more alive and wakes you up in a way that those other things that you do comfortably uh, can't possibly do for you. Yeah, I've certainly experienced it and I'm sure most of the people in the room have where, you know, you do something that going in, you were absolutely terrified and stressed out and couldn't sleep. And then when you do it, you're like, I did that. That was me. And that feeling of accomplishment, you don't get from those things that are easy and safe. You just don't, mm -hmm. it's not the same thing. Yep, yep. Um, th this brings up another point, um, which I'm gonna, get a little tangential about, but it's so important, is that when you know that there's something you ought to be doing and you're not doing it, it creates what I call an open loop. And it actually puts a halt on so many different ways in your business because you're aware that there's this thing you ought to be doing. So it's on your mind, whether consciously or subconsciously, and it's holding you back because you're postponing a decision since it's mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Right. And when you're postponing that decision, there's other things that get postponed in, postponed in the advancement of your business as well. Uh, and, and just to recognize, if you're postponing one thing, it's going to affect other things in your business also because it's not like this one thing that you're holding off on or procrastinating on is over here and everything else is over here. There's this ebb and flow, and per perfectionism just stops you over and over and over again, yep. where there might be doors open for you right now, and then they close by the time you, that you make a decision, and that opportunity is going away forever. So 
become aware of where you're having these open loops because it affects your cash flow, it affects your growth, it affects your connections with other strategic partnerships, and it just brings everything to a halt. And list those things out, start to really move through them and make yes and no decisions one at a time, and you'll start to see more flow in your business as well. That's fantastic, Megan. That was a wonderful tangent. I'm glad we took that. <laughs> but it's totally true. You know, sometimes something's not happening over here and you focus on this, focus on this, but it's actually something else going on that needs mm -hmm. attention. Um, da, da, da. So the other question that I wanted to be sure to touch on is one person wrote in and said, marketing is my biggest weakness. How do I push past the fear so that prospects can get to know the real me? I uh, would like to share how I dealt with that because it was really uncomfortable for me also in the beginning. Uh, being trained as a therapist, you're trained not to really share very much about yourself. And I always kept my professional side separate from my uh, personal side. My clients really didn't know the person that I am uh, at all because it wasn't always in their best interest to do that. And going from therapy into business coaching, it's a little bit of a different model where I've learned that there's actually benefits to sharing about myself, just like I'm doing right now. Uh, so what I learned was that there's a benefit to transparency. And if I can show someone that I struggled with something similar also and how I was able to move through it, it that story actually has a lot of benefit to someone else. They get to see me not just like up here, but that I'm actually more relatable. So it creates rapport with someone when you can share something about yourself with them and how that was a challenge for you too. The other thing that I really figured out early on with marketing is as I got more comfortable with transparency, my rule of thumb was if I didn't want something on that New York ticket, ticket tape that they have on Times Square, <laughs> don't post it or, yes. or share it. So there's a difference between personal and private. And the things that are private, I don't share on, pers on social media or in any of my marketing because it's just private. It's a boundary issue. The things that are personal, like talking about that fear that I had with uh, sharing about myself and my own stories and how I worked through it, is something that is personal also. It was my experience that I had to uh, be able to figure out. However, by talking about it, it benefits other people too. And, and to recognize that no matter what you're doing, whether it's a social media post on your personal page or a business page or in a group, it's all your brand and you want to have some consistency there all the time because those things never go away. However, just go ahead and try a little bit at a time with sharing some personal things because people find you more relatable and that's what people really want is to know that they know you, uh, which is knowing that you exist, that they like you, which is that you're credible, that you're relatable. Uh, they can see where maybe they have struggles that you had also, but you were able to solve them. And then down the line, the trust will come. And that's when the marketing becomes profitable. Absolutely. Sorry, my yes, brain yes, just. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 that was a I lot of information. <laughs> I had a thought and it just left. <laughs> this is like drinking from the fire hose. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's why we're recording this. The video is going to be available on Facebook, available on YouTube, so that people can come back, including me. <laughs> yes, yeah. basically, it's a process. Yes. And to be able to share a little bit about yourself, people will actually want to um, know more about you and right. it'll serve you well. Yeah, and I think that the point that you were making about personal versus private was really important in general. Like this new world of social media, po people post the most ridiculous things. And sometimes I feel like commenting, um, you sure about that? Because you know, future employers and mm -hmm. future partners and past partners and family. And if you don't want it to be public, don't post it publicly. <laughs> right. 
Because it stays there forever. Forever, yeah. And, and to realize that as uh, maybe you're even looking at a new client, you might be Googling them because that's what we all do first oh, yeah. and, and checking them out. Uh, so if there's a disconnect between how someone's showing up and what they're seeing on social media, that, that's going to raise some questions about your integrity. Oh, absolutely. And I, I feel like related to, you know, being real with your clients and everything, I know a lot of people in this group and in the business world really struggle with pricing. And I know that you were a huge help to us when we were switching from our hourly billing to package billing and how do we, how do we stick the dismount, basically. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Uh, what I actually want to say is I go into a deeper dive uh, with that in my free book called Get Paid What You Were. And that's at my uh, website called businesssuccesssolution.com forward slash worth. Just putting your name and email address and you'll be able to download the steps to figure out the whole pricing thing because it's a big obstacle for so many entrepreneurs. Uh, most entrepreneurs start out charging by the hour or charging by the, ses the session. I will say that it's an old business model, it's like using a rotary phone instead of a dial-up phone. <laughs> it's really old, it's antiquated, and what that does is it has you compete with other people based upon a uh, price where you become a commodity. People can't separate you from anybody else because now you're attracting people that are, tend to be price sensitive who are not the most loyal clients, and that they hesitate reaching out to you because every time they re reach out to you, it's going to be another charge. So they don't necessarily get the full value of what you have to offer. And the other thing is when you're charging by the hour, you're focusing on what you do. That's not why people are really reaching out to you for what you do. They're reaching out for you for what you know. And the shift that I encourage my clients to focus on is going from hourly billing or charging by the session over to value-based pricing. Mm -hmm. With value-based pricing, it really emphasizes your expertise and what you know as opposed to what you do. Because of that, you actually stop competing with other people who offer a certain, a similar uh, type of service because now we're focusing on you becoming a trusted advisor, which goes beyond that tackle, tactical thing that you offer. Uh, but with value-based pricing, people know what they're going to be investing in to work with you before you even get started. And therefore, when things come up, they're more likely to actually reach out to you and ask for your help as opposed to second-guessing whether they order work further with you or ask for help because there's going to be an additional fee for that. So I fully encourage people to go with value-based pricing. Uh, Part of what I look at is five steps as you make the transition. It's figuring out, first of all, what are your strengths? What is it that makes you exceptional and where your expertise lies? And really to focus on that. The second thing that I look at is how to recognize that success is messy and where you're overthinking yourself, where you're stopping yourself. Pricing yourself is one of the most uncomfortable things you can possibly do because now, now you're trying to sell yourself. And if I ask you to double or even triple your rates, what is it that comes up for you? So, so recognize that it's really messy going through this in the beginning. Uh, how to separate fees from time, because time makes you a commodity and we want to really have the value come out with your expertise and being a trusted advisor. The fourth step is looking at how to stand out as the go-to expert and with that, it's knowing the system that you take people through or the steps. That way, it takes it from something kind of abstract where, oh, I just do this thing, where you can create the system and explain it to them and articulate it so they can really see that you know what you're doing and you have that expertise. And the fifth step is really solve a problem. When you know your ideal client, you know that problem that they really deeply struggle with, that you are uniquely qualified to solve and to be able to figure out how to solve that problem. So all that is really laid out uh, to get you started in my book, How to Get Paid What You're Worth, which is at uh, businesssuccesssolution.com forward slash worth. Excellent. Oh. And um, Kathy, yeah, Kathy has been... 
Yes, go ahead. I was going <laughs> to. Hi, Kathy. Kathy's been hanging out as an attendee. She doesn't currently have a webcam, so she's just lurking there. Mm -hmm. uh, but she posted a great question in the chat. Um, she was wondering, how do you feel about posting your pricing, hourly or value, on your website? If you are competing on price, post your uh, prices because then you're going to get people that are price sensitive. Uh, if you are going ahead and you're pricing on value, don't post your prices. What you want to do is in, enroll, uh, invite them into a consultation with you mm -hmm. where you can ask questions, see if it's a good fit, because they need to see the value of what you have to offer before you can even talk about how it is working together. Uh, if it's not a good fit, you don't have that discussion about how it would be to work together. So I would say don't post your prices because uh, you want to really be able to show the value. And a lot of times with value-based pricing, you might have different price points for different clients because you're pricing for the client as opposed to the service. Yeah, exactly. And that's what Kathy just added in the chat is that no two clients are the same. So it can be really challenging when you sell a service like we sell. It's not like, you know, here buy this widget. You know what the cost is. You know what the price is. Every customer is different, but they're still getting the same thing. When you're selling a service, the service can't be the same for every client. Absolutely. There's a difference between whether you have inventory where you want to go ahead and post your prices Whereas when you're selling a service, you really want to focus on value. Uh, and, and one of the things that we did together, Vanessa, is we went ahead and shifted from you just doing compliance work to we now have packages and right. you have different types of packages because different clients have different needs. Absolutely. Different clients have different needs and the compliance is getting mm -hmm. faster and easier and faster and easier with all the great apps that are out there. And so really showing clients, this is what else we can give you. And, and, and that's also uh, something that's a downside to pricing by the hour is as technology gets better, as you gain more expertise and you become more efficient at what you do, if you're charging by the hour, you're making less money per client than when you focus on value because clients would actually rather you do it faster. Mm -hmm. And if they know that they can get results faster, that actually has more value than when it's a long drawn out process. Absolutely. And also when you price hourly, you're punished for getting better at your job. Mm -hmm. If you get better at doing the same work, it still has the same value to the client. It's still worth it for them to have correct books, correct reports, all those mm -hmm. things. It's worth the same amount to them, but you are getting paid less because you got better at doing it. A absolutely. And Kathy, your um, comment about posting a price with bank feeds, uh, and transactions, you, you can't price the same when, like you mentioned, one client has 100 transactions a month and another one has 1,000 transactions a month. Or maybe one client is just starting up and it's really simplified for them, whereas another one might have multiple businesses. Uh, so this is why you want to really price for the client as opposed to the service. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we are a little bit after 11, um, as much as you and I, I'm sure, could talk about this stuff all day. I want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's time. Is there any last point that you really wanted to hit? Uh, basically, I want to uh, say if you are thinking about doing something, advancing your business in some way, and uh, there's things that you're stopping yourself, just recognize that if it's uncomfortable, you absolutely ought to be doing it. A lot of times as entrepreneurs, we're fiercely independent. We have control issues. We're perfectionists by nature. And we postpone things because we overthink it, wondering what other people are going to say or uh, push back. I just want to say what other people are going to say and what their thoughts are are none of your business. Just go ahead and do it if it feels right for you. Follow your heart. Follow your gut. Um, you'll always make the right decision. I think that is a wonderful, wonderful point to end on. Thank you so much, Lauren. This was a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> mm -hmm.